Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, and thank you for joining us for our What Does Justice Mean with Justice Peggy Quince. We're so honored to have you today, and thank you to all of you all who are participating with the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. Briefly, for those of you all who don't know what we are, we are a think tank at St. Petersburg College that was created by Congressman Bill Young. Congressman Young sought to have a space, a safe space, for nonpartisan discussion on social, political, and economic issues in a bipartisan manner, and to also really explain the scope of what government can and cannot do. This month, we're proud to celebrate Black History Month with our Student Government Association, and we're so grateful to do this collaboration with Stephanie Henningsen, who's the coordinator of the Clearwater Campus for Student Life and Leadership. We're gonna start with our slides and I'm going to introduce Justice Quince and then give a little bit of couple of facts about Black History Month before she has her presentation. So Justice Quince is retired. She was born in Norf Norfolk, Virginia and she's the second of five children. Um, the justice and her siblings hold family near and dear to their heart and enjoy family gatherings. After she completed her undergraduate law school, she married, her law, married a fellow law student, the late Fred Buckingham and they have two daughters. She earned her BS degree in zoology from Howard University and then followed her JD with the Catholic University of America. She also is a recipient of an honorary doctor of laws degrees from Stetson University College of Law, St. Thomas Uni University School of Law and Nova Southeastern School of Law. I like to also share that she is a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I was just teasing earlier, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta. I love um, interacting with our Divine Nine sisters. And also as a fellow HBCU graduate, I'm very proud and honored to share this stage with you. Also, interestingly, we were on a program last night and I got to hear um, amazingly how she was appointed by three justice um, governors. Of course, I knew that, but to hear the timeline and frame for that just speaks to bipartisanship and the importance of understanding our space. So thank you so much. Before we move forward, I'd like to do a little bit of highlighting about some icons in the community um, who have impacted. First, we have uh, Morris Milton, who is one of the most dedicated and courageous attorneys in St. Petersburg, Florida. He partnered with Ike Williams in the law firm of Williams and Milton from 1974 to 1990. And he established the Democratic Black Caucus of Florida and served at the St. Petersburg branch of the NAACP. I hate reading these bios because it doesn't do depth to the human beings and hopefully um, Justice Quince can elaborate on some of these icons as we talk today. But when you speak to people in the community, you hear such positive um, messages about how our icons were able to navigate challenging spaces um, in their uh, quest for equitable change. Next slide, please. We have, of course, Ike Williams, who is also from Georgia. He moved to St. Petersburg in 1942. He served in the United States Army and went to New York University Law School. Upon graduation, he joined the Fred G. Minnis um, Senior Law Office as an associate He's also very well known for voter registration drives and it served as the president of the St. Petersburg branch of the NAACP. Next slide, please. C. Bet Winbush is um, one of my favorites because she was the um, first black female lawyer in Pinellas County and the first black vice mayor for the city of St. Petersburg. Looking at her history, you are in awe of her um, transformation because most of this she did in her second half of life with kids. And I went to law school with a child, so I, I, I honor um, that, that space of trying to balance life and still achieving your goals. Next slide, please. We have um, Judge Patrice Moore. Um, Judge Patrice Moore is a colleague and friend and well-known community active in the community. She is the first African-American female circuit judge for the Sixth Judicial Circuit. Um, she is the current Unified Family Court Administrative Judge, and she is uh, completely committed to transforming our youth. Next slide. And then we have Judge Charles Williams, who is an alumni also of Howard University in Washington, DC, and earned his law degree from the University of Florida. He is a circuit court judge in the 12th Judicial Circuit, and he has um, a very uh, wealth of knowledge in a lot of areas. If you ever like to Google him, he has a lot of interesting um, biographies and documentaries that he engages in and is well, really committed to our community. Next slide, please. And we have Judge Michael Andrews, who um, for the attorneys in town has, has been a huge mentor for many of us. Um, 
he uh, is committed to um, making change work and to making lawyers do their job of giving back and giving service. So with that, I think that's all of our slides that we wanted to highlight today for our judges. And now I'd like to say thank you again to Stephanie and have her say a few words on our Student Government Association. Stephanie. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming out today. This is made possible through our Student Government Association college-wide. And we just wanna thank Justice Quince for coming out and feeding into the lives of our students by sharing her knowledge and her perspective. Student Life and Leadership, which oversees Student Government Association, puts on weekly events to keep everyone engaged during these, shall I say, different times. Next month, we'll be celebrating Women's History Month, so we invite you to stay tuned by looking at the SPC events calendar as well as the workplace. So sit back, relax, be prepared to be fed by this knowledge by our justice. Let me let you all take it away. All right, Justice, uh, we would love to hear you speak when you're done. We'll have a moderated conversation followed by a Q&A. And I would just ask that um, if you have any questions, whatever they are, that you start putting them in the Q&A so that we can be prepared to ask her as she moves along. And again, like anything, we are in a technological world. If something goes awry, we will do our best to keep up. Thanks so much. Good morning. Good morning, St. Petersburg College family, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this special program. And I just, spoke- I'm so sorry to interrupt you. If you could move your camera up, I think the audience would have a better view of you. That would be great. That's perfect. Is that better? Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you okay. So thank you. Good morning uh, again, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this special program. I have spoken with Stephanie uh, Hemmingson for several times, and I want to thank her for putting up with me and having patience with me. Almost at every gathering we attend, we say the following words, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We recite these words, but do we really think about what we're saying? Do we really believe what we're saying? Do we really consider what it means to have justice for all? There is much evidence sometimes that we don't. For the past 20 plus years, I have been called Justice Peggy Quince, Justice Quince, or sometimes just justice. And beyond the fact that judges who are on the federal and state highest courts are called justice, I must candidly admit that I have not given it a lot of thought as to why we are called justices. What does justice mean? The definition in the dictionary and other sources say justice is one, the administering of deserved punishment or reward, two, judgment of persons or causes by judicial process, three, a judge on a high court, especially a Supreme Court. And the, but the definition I like best is impartial, consistent and strict application of established rules or law. Impartial, consistent, strict application of established rules or law. I believe that we might be able to understand justice better if we actually look at what I believe might be some examples of injustice. And, we're, and I want you to listen to these uh, situations and I want you to kind of think about and put yourself in the place of the suspect. On February 23rd, 
2020, one year and two days ago, an unarmed black 25 year old man was pursued by two white men in a pickup truck. The black male, Ahmad Arbery, Arbery, was unarmed and out jogging in a neighborhood in Brunswick, Georgia. He had stopped at a house that was being under construction, but had taken nothing from the house. A second vehicle with one white male in it also pursued the jogger, cutting off any alternative paths. The white men in the pickup truck were armed with both a shotgun and a pistol. The white men confronted the jogger and with no place to go, the jogger tried to stand his ground and fight. He was fatally shot three times with the shotgun. It's alleged that the district attorney's office told the police not to make any arrest. There's some dispute about that. There is no dispute, however, that the father and son who were in the pickup truck and who fired the fatal shots were not arrested until 74 days later and after a video of the killing went viral on social media. The third white male was not arrested until 88 days after the fatal shooting. Arrests were finally made, but as I said, it occurred long after the event. Next, I want you to think about 1921. Prior to May 31, 1921, there was a prosperous black district in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Greenwood. It was dubbed the Negro Wall Street. All of that changed forever during the night and early morning of May 31 and June 1st of 1921. After a 19 year old black youth was arrested for allegedly assaulting an 18 year old white girl, an assault that the victim said did not happen, a largely armed white mob was trying to get to the black teenager in the jail to lynch him. Lynching an act which took place with some frequency in Oklahoma at that time. Now, when um, the people in Greenwood heard that there was a possibly a, an attempt at a lynching, uh, some of the men in Greenwood, uh, some of whom were also armed, went down to help supposedly the sheriff. Well, uh, the sheriff said he didn't need their help. He told both sides to go home. Uh, but at some point, some shots rang out and the uh, people from Greenwood who were well outnumbered, there were approximately 75 of them and about 1500 uh, white people. And so they retreated to Greenwood, but the mob followed them to Greenwood. And there were shootings and burnings, a lot of the businesses there were burned. Uh, there was looting of the stores. Airplanes were used to drop incendiary devices on buildings. It's even alleged that there were law enforcement people in those, in those planes. By midday on June the 1st, over a thousand homes had been burned and over 200 others had been looted. Many of the black owned businesses have been destroyed or damaged, including a hospital, two newspapers, a school, a library, churches, hotels, and others. No one was ever convicted on any charges related to this riot. 
and no reparations were ever made. The estimate of the damage to property was well over a million dollars, which would translate in today's dollars to well over $32 million. By the way, all charges against the young man uh, were dropped and he left town and never returned to Tulsa. Justice or vigilantism. Florida has not been immune. On February 26, 2012, in Sanford, Florida, a young black male was walking in a neighborhood uh, where his father's fiance lived. A, I guess, community watch person is, is uh, I believe, how he's termed. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman uh, saw him and said he looked suspicious. So he called the police. The police told him to not to exit his vehicle and not confront him, but Zimmerman decided he would confront him. And uh, in the altercation that followed, um, Zimmerman fatally shot uh, Trayvon Martin and he was later acquitted by an all-female jury. Justice or more vigilantism. And finally, I want to tell you about uh, an incident that sparked much uh, discussion about a reform in this country. And it, on the, in Indianapolis, on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd was accused by a store clerk of passing a counterfeit $20 bill. Four police officers arrived on the scene. George Floyd was arrested, placed in handcuffs with his face down in the street. One of the officers put his knee on George Floyd's neck while the other officers were holding, two of the other officers were holding him down and one of the officers was making sure that no passerby, none of the people in the street intervened. <clears throat> the knee was held on Mr. Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And during those final two minutes, there was no mo movement and no pulse. The knee was kept on his neck, even as emergency medical personnel arrived. The four officers have been, since been charged and of course, each is blaming the other. A video of the officer's knee on Floyd's neck has been viewed by millions and there is no doubt as to the identity of the person who had his knee on the neck. Justice or police brutality. After the killing of George Floyd, <clears throat> there were mostly peaceful protests in all 50 states, as well as in many foreign countries. All of these protests there were largely gatherings at all of these protests, there were large gatherings of police and many, any rowdy protesters or outsiders were arrested. Now you juxtapose that situation, these largely peaceful protests with the police presence at our Capitol on June the 6th, 2021. Instead of the lines of police officers that we saw doing these protests, there were few at the state, at the Capitol building. There appeared to be only a minimal number of law enforcement, despite the fact that there had been extensive public knowledge that thousands were, were expected to rally in, in Washington, DC. And because there were few, the Capitol was overrun and uh, breached. 
Interestingly, not one person was arrested on the scene. Ask ourselves, was this an impartial, consistent application of the law? That's what justice is, an impartial, consistent application of the law. It, well, it's clear to me that justice requires the unbiased participation of all the parties involved. Contact with our criminal justice system begins with law enforcement. The making of arrests that are largely without incident requires officers who have let, not lost their humanity and treat suspects as human beings, regardless of their race, their gender, or any other factors. Law enforcement then turns the matter over to the prosecutor's office. There again, the job of the prosecutor is not just to get a conviction, but to do justice. That justice involves evaluating the facts as known at that point to determine the appropriate charges and then comes in the judicial system. Judges must, if a defendant is convicted, met out the punishment, the punishment that is appropriate without consideration or bias. And I know Many of you are probably aware that several years ago, there was a study that seemed to demonstrate that black defendants were being given harsher sentences than their white counterparts who were similarly situated. Impartial, consistent, and strict application of the law. So what about what's happening now that we are in this period of the COVID-19 pandemic? There are many aspects of the justice system that has been affected by COVID-19. And I'm sure most of you know that <clears throat> courts and attorneys, law offices had to close and plans had to be put in place quickly to accommodate the continued uh, business of the law. During this time, crime has not stopped. There are still car accidents. There are still domestic violence issues. Uh, there are any number of economic issues that still must be adjudicated. And so the court system had to put in place guidelines uh, in order to deal with those cases. And these guidelines, of course, had to, had to follow the CDC guidelines of social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, and everything. Proceedings that uh, needed to take place uh, and that could not be postponed were done remotely as we are doing lots of things remotely these days. And, on this, and they were being done on the same kind of platforms that we're using here today. Um, but sometimes, however, people actually had to appear uh, in the courtroom. And uh, <clears throat> so we had to practice all the CDC guidelines. And even using uh, these remote platforms, we had special issues of privacy and sensitive materials that had to be uh, dealt with. But one of the issues that still, I believe, must be addressed in this COVID period is our jails and our prisons. There was in a recent article from the Associated Press that indicated one in five prisoners, 275,000 people in the United States prisons and jails have been affected with the coronavirus and more than 1,700 have died. This is at a rate of four times that of the general population. And the spread in our prisons show no sign of stopping. 
And and there have been uh, some suggestion that even these numbers are serious underestimates of what is really going on. Yes, these people have committed crimes and they are being punished. That is a part of justice. But these people are also in the care and custody of the state or federal government. And there seems to be no way to safely social distance in many of these facilities, especially those with open dormitories. The CDC guidelines become almost meaningless. And it's not just the prisoners. There's much concern for the prison employees. And many of them have also uh, been affected with the coronavirus. Uh, at the beginning of uh, this pandemic, there was some uh, early movement to uh, release uh, some offenders who were nearing the end of their sentence, some who were a low risk uh, to their communities and some who were medically vulnerable. <clears throat> Um, the results from uh, that were spotty and, uh, and taking place very slowly. And even now, uh, there is some pushback on the issue of whether or not the vaccine uh, that prisoners are, should be moved up on the list to get the vaccine. <clears throat> We must, however, I think, confront the fact that we need to do something about stemming uh, the spread of the coronavirus in our jails and prisons. Justice, impartial, consistent, and strict application of established rules and law. Have we as a society adhere to this principle. I hope that you think about these examples uh, that I have uh, told you about and truly ask yourself, are we, are we practicing justice in our society? I want to thank uh, St. Petersburg College again, for inviting me to be a part of your Black History program. Uh, I hope that uh, you will uh, continue to have programs that uh, illuminate and, and discuss the issues that are important in our society. And justice certainly is one of those issues. Thank you again, and I appreciate uh, being a part of your program. Thank you, Justice Quince. I am um, honored, of course, to share this platform with you. You said a lot, so I have a lot of questions. I'm going to invite the audience at this time to put questions in the Q&A, if you will, as well. And if you have any challenges, please put in the chat and we will address them. So okay. I wanna start off with what you said because it's so important from a historical perspective to understand our history and to be solution focused oriented as we discuss our history. And what you mentioned, uh, which resonated with me so much is impartial and consistent in application of law. Mm -hmm. And that's important. So for our audience who may not have this historical background and knowledge, um, there is a PBS special that of course that we're not sanctioning or anything, it's just for educational purposes. It's called Going Back to T-Town. And it has a full documentary on the um, Black Wall Street, as you indicated, and the discussion in a full historical context. Also mm -hmm. for your viewers, for our participants, I wanted to let them know that there is, um, I know his case law is kind of hard if you're not a lawyer, but there is a case that um, a colleague sent to me and it's called Clarence Jameson versus Nick McClendon. And I can have that as a resource. It's a U.S. District Court case where it literally goes and outlines almost verbatim exactly what you said about the, his, the history of, um, of bias in our system and how we can better address it. And so as I was doing my research to discuss these things with you, 
I was focusing because the Institute tries to focus on solutions of your thoughts about how all this impacts, and you mentioned criminal justice, but how these challenges infiltrate into our health system, as you discussed with COVID, how they create generational challenges for educational opportunities, how they create challenges with future housing and employment issues, and how then they impact not just the individual who enters into the criminal justice system, but the systemic challenges related to the core family as a result. And I wonder as your lens having um, a depth of knowledge um, in, in the area of justice, if you could talk about what you've seen, how it impacts. And finally, before you begin, I wanted to acknowledge, I have a colleague, um, a dear friend of ours that died immediately because of COVID for volunteering and working in the prison system. So these, mm -hmm. these issues mm -hmm. that we, uh, we deal with and we grapple with are very challenging sometimes to articulate in a space where we can have a conversation where no one is judging one another and you can open and hear the conversation and you can discuss the facts and move towards what would be better programs. And I said one more thing, but of, of course I, I don't have this rare opportunity to talk with you. Um, I was listening today about New Jersey and them changing the laws for uh, to allow there to be a more open space um, with use of marijuana and expunging records and to allow uh, a broader use and giving the opportunity to enter into this billion dollar industry um, for minorities in, in general. So, you know, connect that weave, if you, that web, if you can, for how, when someone <clears throat> enters into this system, how it doesn't just impact them, but how it, enter, how it uh, impacts generations of families. Okay. There was so much in, yeah. in what you just said. And, and before I forget, you know, I'm a little bit older <laughs> and uh, sometimes I, I'll, I'll have a thought and it's gone. But one of the one of the things that I would recommend to people to watch um, tomorrow night, I believe it is, it's a uh, it's a movie called um, The United States versus Billie Holiday. Uh, it's on Hulu. Uh, I saw I, I saw a discussion of it by the director and uh, the screenwriter, and they and it sounds like a very interesting um, uh, uh, presentation. We all know that Billie Holiday uh, was a drug user, but we don't know the underlying story, and I believe that's what this is going to be about. Uh, but there's so many people who are drug users or prison. We're going to stick to prisoners because I believe that's the that's the question that you asked. Who we don't know their underlying story, but we do know that there are systemic racial problems in the United States. And it covers so many aspects of our lives and, and, and the lives of the people who are uh, incarcerated, uh, you know, from poor education to substandard housing, uh, you know, to um, you name it, uh, I, I, you know, jobs that don't really pay uh, to help to really take care of a family. Um, and so some people give up hope. Now, those of us probably on this call and a lot of people that you know uh, didn't give up hope. They, they moved beyond what those circumstances are. But there are people who get who was given up hope and have moved, and so they find themselves doing things that are illegal and end up in our justice system. One of, another interesting um, article that I would commend to you, and actually I don't remember the name of it, but it's about the, the school to prison uh, pipeline. Many times our youth get into trouble. Youth of all uh, races. But if the police officer takes one youth home to his parents and the other youth to the detention center, you've already got a disparity 
in our system. You've already got one person on a track that could lead to more and more um, um, justice system uh, touching. You know, you move from there to the next incident. And so we as a country and we as a people and all of those who believe in those words that we say when we pledge allegiance to the flag, we need to really be about addressing all of these underlying issues to address all the institutional uh, racism issues and until we do that, we are going to we are going to see our young people, uh, elder people, also of course, uh, in our criminal justice system. There, I with this COVID nineteen, I must tell you, I have spent a lot of time doing a lot of reading, uh, and there are so many books. Uh, out there that I would recommend to people to use. One of them uh, to read. One of them is Cass. If you have not read, read Cass, we we talked all the in, in history and all those about the caste system in India, but we never think about the fact that we have such a system here in the United States. Please, I recommend to you that you read that and and really. Think about what is being said. And I, I can only say to you and to all of us that until we are willing to accept that there are issues of institutional racism in this country, until we are willing to uh, deal with that, we are going to have these kinds of uh, criminal justice issues. I think we have some questions for the um, from the chat that I'm going to take and encourage more people to put questions. Um, okay. While I'm preparing for my next question, I'll lighten the note and I'll say, uh, this is from um, one of our participants. Thank you so much, Justice Quince. I am inspired by you. The role of judges and justices is so critical. What advice would you give particularly young attorneys who may find themselves representing parties and the types of cases you have mentioned? And then separately, on a personal note, how are you enjoying retirement? <laughs> well, I'm going to start with the second question. Uh, excuse me. I really have been enjoying my retirement. I retired in uh, January 18 of 2019. And I went off on a four-month cruise. Um, and then uh, in January of 20, I went off on a two-and-a-half-month cruise and just got back the last cruise ship uh, they let back into Fort Lauderdale. And so I have been try trying to see more of the world and understand what goes on in other countries. And, and I've really enjoyed that. But of course now uh, traveling is on a whole, but I find myself uh, during this last uh, election cycle getting involved in our election. Uh, I was a poll watcher. I did, I did what I could do, I think, to help get out the vote because I believe, I truly believe that everyone who wants to should in fact vote and that their vote should be counted. So uh, that's what I've been doing in my retirement. Uh, as for uh, what the advice I would give any young person who is interested in becoming a judge, that whatever you are doing now, whatever area of the law you are practicing in now, that you do the best that you can, that you become proficient in what you are doing. Your colleagues will know that. Become a part of bar associations. Uh, become a part of community groups. You're going to need recommendations. And you want people to be able to say, she or he is an outstanding lawyer, that their work, my favorite say, one of my favorite sayings is, my word is my bond. 
if you practice with integrity, others will know it. They will be willing to give you uh, recommendations and and, uh, you will get to where you want to be. But integrity is very, very important. And we don't have any other questions right now. So I'll ask my question now and make some comments. I'm from the Midwest. So what you said to me resonated about the officers. When I was growing up, there was a huge platform called Officer Friendly. I don't know if that was like a national platform or a Midwest platform, but the officers spent a lot of time with us so that we had a different connection with them. And, and that was children of all races integrated. And it made a difference in how you interact um, with officers. So I'd like to comment that I agree with community matters because all those other issues will not completely go away, but they become less crucial when we get to know each other as people, when we engage with each other in our regular everyday lives and not when there is a life um, event, traumatic event that happens to us as a whole, a society as a whole. But it's different when we engage one person at a time, one community at a time, you know, serving and really giving back, I think really changes the footprint. So although I'm not a judge or a justice, I would say that what I valued as a practitioner is a well-rounded human being and one that really had access to all different people. Mm-hmm. Because then the issues when someone comes before you are human issues and we all walk around with biases and so you're able to shed that a little bit more when you have a, a broader spectrum of people you engage with and a, a more logical empathy. So, so that's what I would say. I was, <laughs> and, and that's, and you know, that's very true um, because we all have, you, we all do have our own biases and prejudices. And anyone who tells you that they don't is lying. <laughs> We all do, and but we have to recognize that we have them. We have to accept the fact that we have them and we have to deal with that. And we cannot, uh, especially if you are a judge or you are in law enforcement, we cannot allow that to sway us on how we treat people. We have to start from the premise that everyone who comes before us is a human being. Everyone has their own particular story. Everyone cannot be painted with the same brush. They're criminals in every race. (laughs) There are good people in every race. So we have to take the person that we're dealing with and not in fact, as I said, uh, paint them with the the brush of whatever prejudice we have against someone else. Well, we have a fun fact, which um, you mentioned cast and I recently read cast. I read it on Audible and I'm not really an Audible fan, but it's a long story. My daughter and I are sharing our Audible account so that we can have a connection. And so she actually introduced me to this. And um, the book is just fascinating. Even if you have a lot of history and knowledge in this area, it is just overwhelming to see the amount of context that she places about what caste really means on all levels. But I just learned from Neil, thank you for sharing that, um, your mention of caste prompts a local black history story. Author Isabel Wilkerson was an intern at the St. Pete Times, now Tampa Bay Times, when she was just beginning her journalism career. And this would have been around 1970 or 1980. So it's very interesting that a lot of uh, uh, tremendous people, as we learned last night too on the program that we shared, come from the Bay Area. Yeah, and you know, she wrote another great book called The uh, The Warmth of Other Suns. Uh, And you know, there are, because I think of all of uh, what took place uh, during the the spring and summer, all the demonstrate, the protests, all of that, there there are a proliferation of books about um, racism, about uh, white supremacy, uh, all of the, and, and there, and I think all of us need to read some of them and really get our history because like it or not, and I certainly don't like it, our history books don't do justice 
to real history. Uh, you, if you, I've never read in any history book about the Tulsa massacre. Yeah, uh, they hardly mention slavery. I mean, it's almost like you know it, it didn't happen. Uh, oh, there's no mention of of of, of how these people were captured and brought over involuntarily. And so uh, it, it, until our, our, our books, our history books, the ones that we go to have in our school system, start reflecting real history, we have to educate ourselves. And there are plenty of, of, of stories to be told. I mean, the first time I heard about uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was, it was, it was just heartbreaking. And that, and we know that that district has never recovered from that massacre in 1921. I have to say, I agree with you with um, educators, and I actually have two strong educators in my family. And um, when I entered into Spelman, we got a reading list, and I remember it was the first time that I first saw African-American authors. And this was a huge assignment, you know, of learning our history and our college focused um, on women's studies and religious studies because Spelman is a, at the time was a religious institution. And <laughs> it's a bit evolved with our motto. So I'm saying that for that reason. And, um, and so it, it, you're right in terms of how we present history, but I think the difference with the generations now, of course, because they have their cell phone and the computer in their hand at their fingertips all the time, that although some of these documentaries might be not be preferred websites like the History Channel or PBS or C-SPAN, they have a just chock full of information with real um, just true facts so that you're able to understand what history looked like, and we've been able to document that. Before we move on, because we're coming to the end of our hour, and I can't believe it's moving this fast, but we have two more questions from the audience. They're both related to government. Um, one is, is it too late for the government to rectify racism now that it's fully out of the closet? And the second one is explaining um, the difference between an elected and appointed official, and what can we do about appointments? Okay, well, I'll start with the last one. Uh, well, elected, of course, is you decide to run for an office. You have a, uh, generally, you have an opponent and, you know, you lay out your credentials and what you plan to do and they do the same and, and the people have a choice between you and them. Uh, and an appointed position and I, in our state, all the, uh, the, the justices on the Supreme Court, and I'm going to do it from the legal angle, the justices on the Supreme Court and the judges on the district courts of appeal, uh, and we have five district courts of appeal in our state, they are appointed. And they go through a process where they submit uh, their applications and resumes to a commission that then makes uh, sends up names to the governor. So the actual appointments uh, in, those, in those positions are made by the governor. But then of course, after you have been in office for at least a year, you have to be on uh, the ballot for retention. And although you don't have an opponent, you have to get a majority yes votes from the people of the state or the people of the district uh, where you are uh, to say, yes, you should remain in that position. So that's basically the difference between, you know, elected and appointed uh, positions. Uh, and what was the, the first part? Um, yes, the first question, I'm gonna pull it back out. It may have been erased. The first question was basically, can the government do anything to address, and I think the exact verbiage was rectify racism. What could the government do or say to address it? Um, I think that was the gist of the question. My apologies, the question erased. So I yeah, uh, well, you know, there's so many aspects of it. As we already said, we've got, we've got the educational aspect of it. We have uh, the housing aspect of it. We have the healthcare aspect of it. 
you know, so we we are going to have to deal with each section of that. We are going to have to make sure that um, our young people get quality education. Uh, we have to make sure that they have access to health care. Now, say what you will about the Affordable Care Act, at least it gave people who were uninsured access to some medical uh, insurance and therefore access to medical professionals. We need to do a better job of making sure, and the government can in fact do it, making sure that everyone, no one should die in this country. No one should remain ill in this country because they do not have access to medical attention. That is absolutely crucial. Whether that means, you know, God forbid the word, socialized medicine or not is another story. I am not a, a, a healthcare professional. And so I cannot really address what that should look like. But I do know that we, sh everyone in this country should be able to go to a doctor when they need to uh, and without having to worry about whether it's going to take their entire paycheck to do so. Uh, <laughs> you know, this, and they, actually, this is a whole nother topic. We could go on and on about what could be done to to break down uh, these these barriers. And we just don't have enough time today. <laughs> we don't have enough time today, but it has certainly been a pleasure spending this hour with you. And thank you so much because I know that you're busy. I actually saw you do the debate this week for the Florida um, bar presidents or the would be Florida bar presidents as well. So <laughs> we had quite a busy week this week. I've been watching you. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Student Life and Leadership, and specifically, of course, the Student Government Association. Stephanie approached me and said, we want to do something for our students. The students had wanted to have an active voice, and we want to make sure that we give the students a voice. All voices are welcome. Um, of course, this is Black History Month, so they got the honor of selecting who they wanted to hear speak, but we're grateful for the conversation, and we hope that we give all students a voice and a platform in this space at ISPS. So with that, we're going to move on to our last slides. Thank you again, Justice Quince. Thank you again, Stephanie, for your time. And we're going to move to our last Black History Facts. And the, the, it's a did you know. So we we're. I always try to find uh, more interesting people as we talk about Black history. There's so much to talk about. But uh, Maggie Lena Walker was the first female Black um, bank president of any race to charter a bank in the United States. Bessie Coleman was the first female of African-American and Native American descent to hold a pilot license. Shirley Chisholm, of course, is the first African-American woman elected to the United States Congress and the first candidate um, for a major party's nomination for president. And Benjamin Banneker is the first African-American mathematician, astronomer, almanac author and farmer and the inventor of the first clock in the 1750s. And Percy Julian is one of the first chemists to receive a doctorate and inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. So um, we, we hope that you continue to do your research and learn a little bit about the history. And we look forward to what Student Life and Leadership is going to do next month for women's history. Next slide, please. So as we're wrapping up, we always like to uh, promote our next programs. Our next program, we're doing a health equity series to talk about the impact of COVID. We've been very instrumental working with nonprofits around the community um, regarding health equity. And so Tim Dutton and a team of people from um, Healthy Foundation St. Pete will talk about the data of how it's impacting our county. Later on in the month, we will have a program with Dr. Coey, who runs the Florida Department in Health. And then we'll have a program with a practitioner, Dr. Gurrier, to talk about uh, what it's like to practice in this environment. Our next slide, please. We had our first um, program in guardianship, which is um, uh, we received a lot of extremely positive feedback. And again, in light of COVID, people are having to make decisions um, and about death in the way they once did not do so um, as much. And so we hope that you join us to learn more about estate planning and understanding the intricacies of it. Next slide. 
Um, we have a economic series that we're doing, and this is the second part of it. And I don't know if you know, but cybersecurity is continues to be a huge issue, but it is here at home too in the Pinellas County area. So there is an issue and breach in Oldsmar, and we're going to have a discussion about what happened and why it mattered. Do we have any more? And then finally, we are partnering with the Seminole Chamber of Commerce to do a regional economic outlook with Jerry Pears, who is, of course, with the Florida Chamber of Commerce. And I think that's all of our slides today. Again, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Um, all Americans have contributed uh, to our society and our fabric, but I invite you to um, evaluate and think about exactly what Justice Quince just said as we close, and that is we have to be an impartial and the application of law is important to how we remain a balanced society. So thank you and please learn more about the Institute by going to isps.spcollege.edu or follow us on Facebook. Thank you for your time. Happy Black History Month.